I've looked into it for over a thousand hours and it is quite disturbing when you find that there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of deceit, there's a lot of strange things going on. It becomes a very nefarious topic once you start delving into it. My guest today is Kevin Noonan. Nice to see you, Tom, and it's great to be on your channel. I've been following your channel for a, a quite a long time and the guests on your show have been fantastic. I've looked so much on your channel. So I live in the north of England, uh, in the United Kingdom. I am a personal trainer by trade or by career or profession. I'm not doing that at the minute. I'm kind of doing a working class type job at the minute, delivering gas bottles to, to pubs and clubs. So I've moved out of my career or a profession to doing a, a kind of standard job. And in regards to climate change, I'm very interested in learning about different topics. So I spend a very large amount of time researching things that I find very interesting and like to know the truth about topics that are important for me personally, but for everybody else. And I find that if you listen to other people, you've got to be very selective in who you trust because a lot of mis there's a lot of misinformation in every field, which, which I'm hoping to cover a little bit in my slides, in my presentation for you today. So today I want to present a little presentation called Climate Change for the Lay Person. So as you can understand, I'm coming at this from an ordinary person in the UK who's not a scientist, as has been on this channel so far. Moving on to my beginning. So I'm Gavin. I'm a personal trainer. Here's a personal trainer. I've invested thousands of hours in studying my own profession. I got onto climate change, as I've already said at the beginning. I've studied over a thousand hours of climate change. Around 300 of those hours have been through reading. The rest of the hours have been through studying and watching and researching videos online, documentaries, debates on climate change. I'm going to give you some factoids throughout this presentation, but food for thought, as we say in the UK. Factoid one, CO2 is only 0.04% of the total atmosphere surrounding the Earth. Humans' contribution is between 3 to 5% of that 0.04%. Probably lost you yeah, the math lost you by now. But in the United Kingdom, it says that we make 1% of man's emissions, which works out at a crazy like, macroscopic 0.0005%. So that is 1% of the supposed 5%. On this slide, I want to talk to you about social bubbles. So it's a bit different to what you might be used to on this channel. In general, we live in a bubble, or a, you could put it another way, a, a goldfish ball. And who we interact with as we go about our day-to-day -day lives has a massive impact on what we're receptive to, what we learn, and how we view topics. So climate change is one of those topics where if we have parents who don't critically think outside their narrative or their their personal experience in life, you're less likely to critically think too, oh, by and large. So social bubbles have a big impact on how you view a topic such as climate change. From the people that you see every day, to your friends, your friendship network, your peers, your colleagues, so it all has a big impact on how you view a topic such as climate change. So factory two, the, nor the Northern Hemisphere varies by 12 Celsius every year throughout the year. The Earth's temperature varies by 3 Celsius every year as a globe. But we're being told that we're going to die if we heat the planet up by 1.5, 2 or 3 degrees over the next 100 years. Something to think about. So my next slide represents the working class person. I'm going to jump to the bottom of the slide just to give you a narrative. While I don't support Russia in one whatsoever in the Ukraine invasion, as it is, but what I'd like to give you some food for thought is that the Russian soldiers have only one narrative in Russia. Those who have critically thought run a, ran, ran, away, ran out of the country before the, the war really hit, really started. So those soldiers have a choice to either 
go to war and die as cannon fodder for the horrible person, uh, dictator, President Putin, or stay at home and end up in prison or a gulag and disappear. While that's relevant is we, we're all limited to some degree to our, our, of our knowledge on a topic such as climate change. We, especially in the UK or the West, most of us want to just go to work, have a living, uh, interact with our family, save, save up money for holidays, pursue our hobbies. And so all this means that we've got very limited time into researching topics such as climate change, which is incredibly vast, a very, very vast topic that takes a very large amount of time to research this topic. So that's something to always bear in mind when you talk about it, not only with yourself, but other people, they just don't have the time to look into the issues. So point being is they trust the sources of information in the mainstream media because they outsource their thinking to other people who they've been brought up and conditioned from childhood to trust people in authority. Fact 3, there are thousands of scientists who don't believe CO2 is causing a crisis to climate, to the climate, yet the media only show one side of it, which is the alarmism. On this slide, I just want to talk to you about the scientific community. When you think about the scientific community, it's presented in a way that portrays a one conscious thinking mind about climate change, even so far as the IPCC, as if it's there's a general agreement on the topics related to climate change. But it only takes a little bit of delving into the topic to find that that's just not the case. If you were to survey 8.8 .8 million scientists that are supposedly in the world today, according to Google, you couldn't really get a survey because the vast majority of those scientists don't specialize in an area that is relevant to climate change. So scientists, scientists look into their careers and specialize in only one or two topics at, uh, in, throughout their career. So even a survey wouldn't be relevant except to those scientists that are in the areas and fields. What you find is most scientists know just as much as the average person because they're specializing and outsourcing their thinking to their other peers who may be more focused on the issue. Slide, what's count for? Factoid four. For the last 10,000 years, it has been warmer today than 6,100 years. The earth started warming 300 years ago, well before industrialization. So this slide represents ecosystems. I'm coming at this presentation a bit differently because I want people to think a bit differently about this topic rather than just having graphs related to the data sets of climate change and understanding all the different factors to this gigantic topic. So ecosystems were all brought up, hopefully we were all brought up to, to appreciate ecosystems and ecology. In the UK, when we introduced gray squirrels, our red squirrels nearly died out. So we all have an idea of ecology, but what we don't often understand or think about is the ecosystems of a topic such as climate change. As Judith Curry, who's an eminent scientist in the field, often talks about ecology and ecosystems within the field of climate change. So in that sense, we have the political ecosystem, we have the scientific ecosystem, we have the media ecosystem, and they're all feeding on a narrative, which basically is providing their survival. And it is about survival, and it's something to think about when we talk about this topic. Factoid five, CO2 lose, loses its heat effect called the saturation level, the more that it is in the atmosphere. Currently, 420 parts per million, it's around eight to 7% saturation. At 200 parts per million, it's around 80% its heating capacity. So this, rep this slide represents you, the individual. I'm going to be focusing this on the United Kingdom. So this issue affects you personally. People in the UK and, and in the Western world are more involved in, the, as I've already said, 
their work, their career, their hobbies, their family pursuits, looking after their children. But it, this is a really serious topic, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this presentation. It's a really serious topic that affects individuals massively in ways that can't even be comprehended. So I'm just going to lay, lay out five facts on the top of my head on this one. So number one, in the United Kingdom, the Conservative Party have just admitted this week that this is going to cost the average household £20,000. Now I'm asking you who has £20,000 in the current climate? Not many people. £20,000, £15,000 for a heat pump and £5,000 for a new gas boiler. Number two, it's a known fact that if we go to net zero or push towards net zero, the more we push to it, the more things are going to get expensive. So that means that our energy bills, which we've already suffered massively in the United Kingdom recently, is going to double or triple. Point number three, if we look at London as an example, Sadiq Khan has used the issue of climate change to expand his ULA zone at great, great misery, suffer, suffering and depression of the residents and people who work and commute throughout London. It's costing people £3,000 a year extra to drive through the ULA zones, costing business tremendous amounts of money and risking businesses and just basically people's careers. Fact number four. In Wales, currently, they've just pushed a 20 mile an hour zone. The irony of this is Blomberg quotes this in the book about how stupid it would be to change all the speed limits to three miles an hour to reduce global warming. And yet we literally have a live example in Wales where the leader has moved the, the some large areas of the country to a 20 mile an hour speed zones at the at the excuse, I should stress, of climate change, largely, largely. And number five, this is about the future. Not the future in the sense that the alarmists want to portray, but the future freedoms of your life and your children and their children. So when, we, when we're looking at this issue, we've got to look at the topic really broadly. Moving on. Factoid six. Bear in mind that this is probably a massive understatement. In my personal research, I've seen and heard people say 500 trillion and 900 trillion from different sources, but we're going to go with a Google. Fact 26, it's going to cost the world over 220 trillion for something that may reduce temperature by less than one degree. Money that could end all mankind's other problems and advance civilization. It said that in America, the Green New Energy deal could cost each household $600,000 per household. For me in the United Kingdom, that's like buying two houses. So it'd be like me being forced to put a mortgage down on two houses. That's how preposterous the, the green policies and the idea that we have to fight a crisis is becoming. The... GDP for the world currently is 113 trillion as, as, of, as of when, when I looked it up. They want us to spend 9.9 .9 trillion a year, which from my own research, we're behind spending at great cost to each person. This money doesn't come from free. It comes from your hands and from your work and from your time. Governments don't have money. The people and citizens of country create the money that the governments are using all for a supposed crisis and finish on this slide and say, if this was not wrapped up as an existential threat, there would be no legitimate reason to spend exorbitant amounts of money on things that probably aren't going to make any difference whatsoever. Don't look up because there's nothing to see. So I'm basing this on the film, but let's move to fact 27. Professor William Happer, an esteemed expert on CO2 and radiation heat transfer, states that a 1% increase in heat adds up to a 0.85 Celsius over a doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial levels. Now, if you've not done much research, that probably won't mean much to you. But basically, that is half of the 1.5 agreement that the governments of the world have tried to agree to keeping the warming, the supposed warming temperature down to. So it's half of that at the huge costs of reducing 
expenditure, the, the heating of the planet. So the, the point of this slide is to get across that the alarmist and the, the, the pro man-made uh, uh, disaster, uh, they're creating a false dichotomy. The movie Don't Look Up is basically a way of propaganda. Um, the director was friends with a guy called Roger Hallam in the United Kingdom, who's the founder or co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, who has basically taught people how to do protesting called civil disobedience. And he is wanting to get people to think emotionally rather than critically think about things for the cause of saving the planet. The issue with that is it's under the pretext that they are correct and anybody else who questions it is, is wrong. So we're getting, a, we're getting put in a false dichotomy. Imagine spending all that money, the whole world economy, to save us from a doomsday scenario that doesn't happen. What damage could that have done to us or what damage will that do to us if we take actions that a lot of politicians, bureaucrats, NGOs, and activists want us to do? Moving on. Factoid aid. It's a fact that CO2 has been 6, 10, 20 times its current level in the geo geological record and there was no runaway or tipping points as we are being told will be now. This is something that's quite, quite um, alarming when you find this out. But in the history of science, I've not said the alarming bit yet, but the, in the history of science, there's been many cases where the majority have been wrong. The, scientist me the scientific method is not 100% infallible. There's been many cases where scientists have been terribly wrong at the cost of uh, many, many people. In a recent study, it was, it was found that over 50% of the peer review literature could not be replicated. Now, I don't expect many people who are not that interested in this topic to understand that means, but that is a massive blow to the scientific community. You can look up why most published papers research findings are false to, to look into more information on that. So my, my presentation is not too long. Where there's abbreviation, there's corruption. Now, I'm not for a second trying to state that every institution isn't good or that everybody in the institu every institution is corrupt. But if you ignore critical thinking and you look into things, what you will find is that every organization and institution has to keep the institution alive and the survival of the institution is paramount. I want, you to, I want to give you a, an example. Can you imagine for one second in a massive meeting at the IPCC, someone who's rather significant, let's say, stands up and say, you know what, I've been listening to Tom Nelson's channel and I've realized that this is nonsense. Can you imagine what would happen to this person's job? Are you not telling me that everyone in the IPCC would turn around and go, oh, I've, I've been watching Tom Nelson's channel as well, or the Art oh, this Institute, and I agree, it's a lot of nonsense. Let's pack our bags, close up, you know, close everything down and leave. So each institution is there for its own purpose, but also for the issues that they make relevant, so that they are relevant. Factoid nine. According to scientists that I've researched, if the whole world stopped all CO2 emissions tomorrow, we wouldn't notice any difference in climate now or in the next 80 years. But billions of us would die very quickly. Factoid 10. Historically, CO2 lags behind temperature 80 to 800 years. You will find that there are different quotes on this figure, but I'm going with the one I've seen the most. From geological and paleoclimatological records. So why is it now leading the temperature and the wet control in the weather? Like Tom Nelson's channel on his background says, CO2 is not the control knob. So very quickly on this slide, this is just a simple uh, suggestion that you think about this topic like a jigsaw puzzle. You have to spend a tremendous amount of time which working class people and the average person just does not have to delve into this topic. And it almost has to be a bit of a hobby or a passion to research it. Now, I've looked into it for over a thousand hours, as I've already said, and it is quite disturbing when you find that there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of deceit, 
there's a lot of strange things going on in the alarm side or the, the scientific community that are projecting the alarm or the fact that certain people have more authority in what they say, like Greta Thunberg, than other people who are serious scientists, you just get ignored. It's it becomes a very nefarious topic once you start delving into it. I want you to imagine a map and you get told that you've only got 60 seconds to look at that map. You're not going to try and remember every town or village in that map to get to where you're going, but you're going to try and get a general layout of what's there. So when you look at this topic, while I could never be classified as an expert on this topic, a thousand hours is a lot of time. And what I've found is that the layout of the land or climate change is, is, is not as it's been told or shared or, or spoken about in mainstream corporate media or politi in politics and in uh, mainstream institutions. So I'm moving on. Perspective. Who is a real activist? So my guess is the majority, because this is Tom Nelson's channel, it might not be the case, but I'm guessing that by and large, the majority of people will know who Greta Thunberg is on the left. But I suspect, I suspect that a large amount of people don't know who the guy on the right is. Patrick Moore, one's a child with absolutely no scientific knowledge who's been used to engage the youth because they don't want to engage the older generation because a lot of the older generation are, are probably questioning the narrative. Patrick Moore, however, is the Greenpeace co-founder. He's got a PhD in ecology, and he has risked a lot in the, in the pursuit of the environment. He really is an activist. He's been attacked maliciously all the, the time while he's been on this side since he left Greenpeace. He stopped nuclear testing, he stopped whale hunting, save the whales, stopped seal clubbing. And as an ecologist, he says we are in a CO2 famine. The RPC is very flawed. The more you look, the more nefarious mistakes in speech marks you find. Factoid 11. The IPCC have directly, sorry, the IPCC have discreetly admitted the worst case scenarios are implausible, but kept this out of the summary for policy makers, a hugely important admission, admitting, I'm going to say RCP because it's easier for this presentation, RCP and RC, RCP 8.5 and RCP 7 are possible, where all the doomsday predictions were made from. So again, going back to vast research, Judith Currier said that the RCP 8.5 and RCP 7 are the scenarios, the worst case scenarios that all the doomsday scenarios that are presented by the majority of the mainstream media, politicians, even the IPCC being fed or feeding off this, these worst case scenarios are totally unplausible. But it wasn't put in the chapter of the relevant chapter for the IPCC report or the summary for policymakers. Very, very nefarious. Factoid 12, the impact of human emissions over the climate is less than 1%. The rest is natural variability. This is in the IPCC's reports, and I'm getting this information from Stephen Coonan, who is a legendary expert on this issue, who has gone through the IPCC reports. Now, this is where it gets really dark. When you look into this topic, as I've already said with the slide on the jigsaw, you find that there are so many strange facts to this issue. One of them is the way data is perverted or presented. So in America, for example, it's well established in the literature that forest fires were five times worse in the early 1900s than they are today. But what they do in the presentations in the latest summaries is they'll focus on a period of time from, say, in the 1970s to date, where they have an uptick in the grass, but miss out the historical past. So this looks really alarming to people who aren't aware that they are zooming in. The IPCC omit the good news and they omit prominent facts. So most of the damage is created, 90% of the damage to, to, to humanity is caused by cyclones and floods. The IPCC state 
that mankind is having no impact on these factors getting worse. Sea rise. Missing the slow years. In Stephen Coon's book, Unsettled, it clearly shows that the IPCC miss a period of time in the 1900s, this just up to World War II, where the sea acceleration had deaccelerated significantly. I want you to think about three millimeters on your fingertip. Try and imagine three millimeters on your fingertip. That's what the scientific data, to some effect, might be 2.7, depending on who you listen to. That's what the scientific data says the sea is rising by every single year. It's not unprecedented, and there's so many nuances from facts to sea level rise that you cannot just assume that we're going to all be flooded out in a gigantic tsunami, as it's portrayed, portrayed in the mainstream media. Another strange thing is they emit over, they emit, sorry, 100 scientific papers about sun-related topics that affect climate or have potentially affect or do affect climate. And they place the sun as negligible and they've reduced the sun's impact over the period of time IPCC reports have been made when there's a large body of evidence to suggest that the sun has an impact on climate. But bizarrely, they just choose to ignore it. Computer models predict the sensitivity levels to be two to four times greater than it actually is. You can look and delve into this to find very quickly that these models are two to four times greater so that the scenarios seem much more worse. What that basically means is for a doubling of CO2, it's making the temperature changes more significant than they actually will be. So it doesn't take much much choice, uh, sorry, it doesn't take much um, investigation to find out there's a lot of strange things going on with the data and all the mistakes seem to be pointing at doomsday rather than other mistakes where it's like, well, things aren't so bad actually. Final point on this slide. When you look into the IPCC, you, you find, and it's well documented that they are very selective on the scientists who take part in the, the formation of the report and they pick people and don't put people in that they feel will not uh, fit the narrative of alarm. That's very, very well documented. Okay, the cause of apostasy. I'm just going to read this out quick. F factoid 13. A group of 650 international scientists compiled a minority report and sent it to the IPC to challenge the IPC's report. So roughly, IPC AO6 last and lodged report was put together by 300 scientists for comparison. Now, I know that you see that other people might claim there were more scientists, but that figures from Stephen Kuhn in one of his interviews, he quotes 300, so it could be thousands. It doesn't really matter. The point is that some significant scientists have questioned very strongly some of the IPCC's claims. The pictures on this slide are scientists of the highest caliber, people I've listened to for hours and hours and hours. They all have incredible pedigree backgrounds within the scientific community. We don't listen to them at our own cost. Many of these scientists have taken risk, lost careers, been attacked by the pro alarmists and the activists and the NGOs. Some of them have been called Nazis and they've had their reputations attacked or climate deniers with a connotation to Holocaust denial. You only, the thing that interests me on this issue is why scientists question it. When a scientist could have their entire career destroyed, have no funding, be censored, be cast out, be, you know, have the fun taken out of them, be silenced, be put in a box and told to shut up. That's what's happened to all these scientists. And these scientists, in my mind, are heroes that the future will remember. In, in the future, we will look at these people as heroes. Factoid 14. It's interesting to note that a 1% change, I'll try and make this clear, a 1% change in cloud cover can affect temperature by 1 degree Celsius. It's well known that climate, the computer climate models that all that, that predict the future predictions cannot simulate clouds properly. 
and that the climate model's margins for error are out by one degree Celsius. So we are being told that we're going to, say, between 1.5 or 4 Celsius, so 4 Celsius for warming in the next 80 years. But the computer mills are out by a large margin in their accuracy. We, they don't admit their margins of error, according to experts. Now, the political elite and bureaucrats haven't got a clue. The, the, it just doesn't matter. It drives me personally as an individual crazy because of the time and research I've put in this topic. For an example, green renewable energy is not renewable. You cannot make a windmill or a solar panel with windmills and solar power energy. You have to use fossil fuels. It's as simple as that. Net zero, if you do a little bit of research, is utterly impossible. The technology doesn't exist. And if anyone says that it does, they don't either understand the topic or they're lying. There is plenty of experts on YouTube that you can listen to that clearly breaks this down. At the moment, we spent trillions, trillions on the development of green technology. And yet the world as a whole is only around 2% are using renewable energy. Nearly at the end, fact choice, a fact, a fact check COVID-19 shock. Again, I'll try to represent this properly as it's a bit, it's one of those facts that's quite shocking. Fact point 15, no state that natural emissions of CO2 are so great they cannot isolate man's CO2 contribution as the background emissions vastly outweigh man's emissions output compared to oceans, trees, etc. So when lockdown happened all over the world at the cost of 14 trillion, they shut down the world economy, especially in the West. And they, 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 they obviously reduce CO2 emissions in more than in all of history. So much so that activists were, were very, very happy about it. So everyone would suspect CO2 emissions were to drop or to pause. But according to, according to Roy Spencer, who's researched and investigated that fact, there was no pause or no stop. So what this implies is that human emissions, man-made human emissions in the modern industrialization aren't having as much of an impact as we may believe. So factoid 16, from 1998, there was an eight year pause in the warming in spite of astronomical increases in CO2 emissions. I think it's quadrupled which was unpredicted by the climate models and has yet to be explained by the scientific community. So I've done a tremendous amount of research as a lay person on this topic, and I'm not a scientist, and I'm really flattered that uh, Tom Nelson's let me do this presentation. But what I would like to say is I've listened to experts for hours and hours and hours. And it, the, the, when, you, when you look and research topics, you get a feeling of what's true and what's not. After thousands of hours, I've come to the con well, I've come, I'm going to present my conclusion in a minute. But after thousands of a thousand or, or plus hours of, of research on this topic, I, I've come to the conclusion that it's not as it's being told or as it's being presented by the by the what we classify as the mainstream. But I've got to say, as this picture represents on this slide, I mean, I'm still open minded, but I've yet to be. Com I've yet to see convincing evidence that there is an alarm, an alarming event happening with CO2 emissions, and that it's something to be frightened about, and it's something that we must take dire action on. So in conclusion, just before that, fact 2017, the last, and this is very significant, it's one of those, those facts that you can just brush off, but this is very significant, fact 2017, the last interglacial was 8 Celsius hotter than today. That fact alone has a huge significance. So if it was warmer by 8 degrees Celsius in the past, how do we know that we aren't going to become warmer at the end of this interglacial? Can we safely say we're not? How can we say that when there's so many questions at this? So in conclusion, after spending, I'm going to read this out, after spending over 1,000 hours up to now and listening, reading every opinion I can find from all sides, 
have come to the firm conclusion that it's impossible for us to predict future climate with our current knowledge and technology. It's extremely dishonest for certain scientists to make such claims or for others not to stand up and honestly express the scientific uncertainties within the scientific literature. If an honest layman, after dedicating over a thousand hours researching this topic, comes to this conclusion and is wrong, then that shows the enormous failings of the academic elite and scientific community in communicating the climate emergency. My conclusion, we are in an era where information is the war zone of minds for the interests of the few. If someone can prove me wrong and show me my mistake in any thought or action, I shall gladly change. I seek the truth, which never harmed anyone. The harm is to persist in one's own ignorance, in, in one's own self-deception and ignorance. So these are the books I recommend. I've read these books. Uh, I've read some of these a couple of times, and I highly recommend these books if you're wishing to know more. Currently, I'm rereading The Frozen, Climate Views of the IPCC, which is a fantastic book. Very in-depth breakdown of AR6 report. And these are some alternative routes to this topic if you don't like reading. I can't recommend Tom Nelson's channel enough. I've watched nearly every podcast and I've learned absolutely tremendous amounts from some of the best scientists and experts in the world on that. I followed the Nexus channel and the Heartland Institute and Tony Heller. Can't recommend them enough. I listened to all these channels for hours in the, on my pursuit of truth. And that's the end of my slide presentation. Very nicely done. I really enjoyed that. I just wanted to point out that you do have your own YouTube channel, and I put a bunch of links uh, from your channel into the show notes here that you've done reviews of books, detailed reviews of yeah. Unsettled and Climate at a Glance, Mark Morano's The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. So uh, I think you've read uh, some of this stuff multiple times, right? You don't just go through it once, you uh, reread it and uh, really absorb yeah. everything. Yeah. I try, I try to, because obviously you know your own limits. So by rereading, by rereading, you pick up things that you, you didn't really notice when you read it the first time. Yeah, I totally so find I, that myself yeah. that I, if yeah. I have a, a podcast I'm interested in, I get a lot more uh, out of it if I listen to it multiple times. So I'm glad. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what is your process? Are you just, uh, are you doing like hikes and stuff or just as you go throughout your day, are you, uh, listening constantly to podcasts to, uh, get up to speed on this? Yeah. Stuff? So at the moment, Tom, I'm studying this topic cause I see it as a form of study. I know that other people may not, but I see it as a form of study. So I, as I, I'm a driver with, as a driver, deliver gas chemistry. So like five, six, seven hours a day, I listen to a lot of videos on, on the topic. So I can listen to six or seven hours a day on this topic. I listen to all of the great scientists that you've got, some of them which you've had on your show. Uh, right. And I, as I say, I, I really listen to re, uh, re listen to them sometimes three or four times, you know, because you pick up very interesting facts about this topic. And it's, it's a very interesting topic, but it's extremely significant and important in our times as well. And as you're consuming these books, do you uh, listen to them or mostly uh, look at the hard copy books? In order to, uh, I read, I read, no, I read them. I read them all. Yeah. I read them. It takes a long time. You know, reading is a very, as you, as you know yourself, it's a very time consuming pursuit. Uh, I read them in the bath. I read a lot in the bath after work. So that's in my form of relaxing. Um, and I'll listen to, I mean, I say I've, I've listened to about 300, I'm sorry, I've read about 300 hours of books. I've got another 10 books to go. You know, I've got another 10 books. And I do, I do want to read more on the other side of, of this topic, but I always kind of follow my own gut feeling on, on issues like we've been through with, you know, COVID and you research things and you just kind of get a sense of things whether, you know, someone's not been entirely honest with you and true on a topic. You can pick up on things and when you went, you know, I've, I've always been very into critical thinking, which is probably the most important skill that people can have, in my opinion. And many people choose not to do that because it can open up some nasty surprises. It really can. And, and people um, in my social group, we are all thinkers and we're all trying to look at things and say, well, is that true? 
you know, what's what what could be the possibility of that not being true? And if it isn't true, why the why the why is why is this person, this politician, not entirely being true or honest, or are they just making a mistake? So yeah, it's it's um it's a very important topic, and that's why that we need more channels like self. We need more channels. We need we need far more noise about the other side, because uh, when I was finishing work today, Tom. You look at people, and in the UK, I mean, it might be different over there, but I'm I'm going to be presumptuous and assume it's the same everywhere. To be honest, like I said at the presentation, most of us are so concerned about just daily life that we don't have the time to research these things, and because of that naivety or ignorance, which you could be, you know, you could be critical of to a degree, but at the same time, you could say, well. People don't really have a choice, you know. If people are working 70 hours a week, when do they fit this in? Um, but the problem with that is they don't understand the consequences of the policies that are being pushed forward by people that aren't asking your opinion on this issue. They're just making assumptions that you want to pay, like in the UK. I mean, in this presentation, I had to be very, I tried to be selective. I could have thrown in so many other points in it. I've had to be try to be really uh, specific. But in the UK, um, there's a green levy that we have to pay on, on, our, on our energy bills. And it doesn't sound like much, but for a working class person, under £72 is a lot of money. And people, I, I, I look at, the, I think about it. If you are being forced to pay money that your hands have earned and it's been forcefully, like, forcefully taken away from you, or potentially for you giving it your children, let's say, or buying a holiday, or you you, you, you buy a bike, and that, that's being taken off you for something that's not even necessarily true. And while I'm not I'm not saying that to I'm not saying it's a hoax, climate change, uh, I have kind of a balanced opinion on it, but I don't believe it's been it is what it's been represented as. I don't believe the science is saying that at all. And that's from a lay person who hasn't got an academic background. So from your perspective in the UK, though, do you think the real world implications are coming to a head kind of, and people are starting to realize that it's costing them money? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. But the, I don't, do you follow, do you follow much of the uh, news in the UK? I don't No. So for example, um, in London, I don't live in London, obviously, but in London, um, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, has introduced uh, ULES zones, which was meant to be just for the for the centre of the city. But he's expanded. He's expanded this, and he slipped up on one interview saying it was because of the climate emergency, and it's that kind of thing. The politicians. Um, I was listening to a podcast today in the van. And he was saying that politicians are using, I um, can't remember who it was, I was listening to it, it was the hot, somebody in the Hotland Institute. And he was saying that politicians are using the climate change to push in their own ideo ideological systems of control or power or political uh, uh, movements. So they don't necessarily even care if it's true. But for me, so, sorry to answer your question, sorry. In the UK, people only really care when it eats directly affecting them like everywhere okay but it's starting to creep in slowly i would say i mean i know you've asked this question on a few of your guests who from this from your, from your kit but i think people are very slow to respond to it and 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 my personal belief tom right is when i'm sure you do a great deal of research i've watched you know i've listened to you for a long time and you i know you've been on it for over 15 years I'm guessing you've read a lot on it, and it kind of it's it, you can kind of get de depressed and despondent on this topic. Do you agree? Uh, I, you could get it. I, I really yeah. enjoy it. I think things are going well. Oh yeah, yeah. So well, I, that's I what I was gonna. That, yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say, Tom. Though, so the it can get you quite depressed if you if you if you look at the fact that people just seem to be totally ignorant a lot by and large on the topic. But what I was going to say was, in spite of um, those of us that see this topic as we, as we, 
you know, as your channel is, had guests on, and you've had guests on talking about very nefarious things that people who aren't elected are doing behind the scenes and stuff like that, or how companies are all pro projecting themselves to this idea of net zero. Um, but my point I make, well, the point I want to make is, it's just not going to work. So to, to me, the whole thing is going to just basically implode on itself because technologically it's impossible. You only have to listen to some of the experts that are online to listen to them. And I know Stephen Kuhn and you know, people who don't agree with it just brush people like Stephen Kuhn and off and they say, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. But for me, I just, I just think it's going to implode. And, and, but, but to what consequence when it does implode, where are we? Are we going to be 10 years down the line? 20 years down the line, how much money we're going to throw into a problem that probably isn't going to be a problem. Do you know, the climate is probably a natural evolving, changing uh, ecosystem or cy cyclic uh, thermodynamic pattern. Yeah, so I'm confident that we're going to win. I don't know when we're going to win, but I think there's going to come a time when people forget that this ever happened, that this uh, CO2 hysteria I think uh, people in the future will uh, barely remember that it ever happened, but we'll, we'll find out. Uh, yeah. Any other points you'd like to make before we go ahead and wrap this one up? No, it's been, I appreciate you inviting me on as a guest. And uh, it's been a interesting process. I hope that my presentations come across all right. I put a lot of time on it. Um, and I just, I just hope more people will wake up because even though I do believe that we are going to be on the right side of history, it does concern me that we are not getting the message out uh, strongly enough. That's kind of my last point, a last point, Tom. All right, very good. So thanks again for your time, and we'll talk to you next time. Uh, Gavin Noonan, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Goodbye.